But we're reading from 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul is writing to the church that he started in Corinth. I'm going to read from verse 35 to the end of the chapter. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendour of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendour of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendour, the moon another, the stars another, the stars differ from star in splendour. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust, of the earth, the second man, from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth and as is of the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will all not fall asleep but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with all mortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour is in the Lord and is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Hello, my name is Ethan. If I haven't met you yet, I would love uh, to meet you over a cuppa afterwards. Uh, I am... Ooh. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Soul Revival. Uh, you'll usually find me uh, at, at Kirui on a Friday night and a Saturday night, um, and at Yarrawarra on a Sunday morning. Uh, so if you want to come say hi when I'm not here... Uh, that's how you come say hi to me, but I'll be here. It's great. Um, I'm going to pray to kick us off, but before I do, I wanted to let everyone know uh, that I am completely comfortable with a heckle. If you think I'm talking too fast, because I get excited and I talk fast, if you think I'm talking too fast or talking too quietly, uh, feel free just to heckle me. Uh, and, if, and, if, and if heckling is not in your temperament, if you are far more polite than that, uh, then uh, feel free to like give me a little signal, like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a dial to turn it up or something like that. Um, and I'm sure you can figure out what a, what a slow down signal might look like. But I just want to, there's my encouragement for everybody. Feel free just to 
let me know, because if I get excited, that's what'll happen. Um, And I'm really excited about this passage, so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dig right into it. So please join me as I pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your word. Thank you that we can be reminded of such beautiful truths. May you remind us of your truth this this morning, or for the first time, show us your plan for our future. Amen. Uh, we're coming to the last few chapters of 1 Corinthians this morning, and that's the book that we've been going through uh, the, and that we've just heard read, uh, was the second half of a very long chapter. Uh, we could do individual sermons on individual verses on 1 Corinthians 15. It is massive. Uh, it is such an important chapter, too, because after all Paul's instruction to the church in Corinth, he finishes by reminding them of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which, uh, if you're writing notes uh, this morning, gives us a joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes so much in our present today. A joyful expectation of the future, it isn't one that we always experience, though, is it? Uh, I was scrolling through some stuff online as I was preparing for this sermon this week, and a question was asked in an online thread. Uh, And the question was this, what are your expectations for your future? It got over a hundred responses, and I didn't have to scroll very far to find this one that I'm about to get, I'm about to read out, uh, and it'll be on the screen. It's from a British Indian teenager, uh, and I wanted to read her response, because I think that although this isn't us necessarily now, it's still a feeling that we can have or have had. It is a beautiful insight from this young girl. So, uh, what are your expectations of the future? Her response is this. Oh gosh, this is a very deep question, and I could go literally anywhere with this. It's a topic that I don't really like to think about a lot because it's so unpredictable. I also have a minor fear of growing older and the future, so that's not great. Uh, I left her emoji in uh, because I don't know how to like do that physically, but you can all kind of see uh, that that's kind of how she's feeling. It's the smiley face with the sweat. Um, it's, it's like a mild panic. She goes on to say, the thing is, that the way the British education system works, it's like a train. You enter at a young age and they pop out a product at the end and they leave you into the world. The journey, the journey so far has been decent, nothing too stressful, thankfully. And I'm hoping it stays that way. I have a few years before the whole university thing and before that I have some major exams coming up. If I want to go ahead and pursue something worthy in my life, The expectations for the grades are are very high. And then, of course, getting into the uni of my choice, that's difficult too. It's, It's not that I'm not smart, but there's only one shot at stuff like this. And then in her post, she hits enter and leaves this space before she says, and I'm scared. I'm working hard to the best of my ability, and I'm just staying hopeful that everything will work out for me in the future and that I can be, I can become the person I'd like to be. You see, I don't even know exactly what I want to become yet, so I'm just hoping that I end up doing something that I enjoy with the people that make me happy. But unfortunately, she says, you can't predict things like this. Sad face. I don't know about you, but um, I find this to be quite relatable. Uh, Most education systems uh, seem to work kind of like that train to differing degrees, and we get thrown out into uh, the world after trying to fulfill the expectation of teachers and society and and friends and family, and, and we seek to pursue, as we go into the rest of our life, something that we enjoy, that makes us happy. But she's right, you can't predict things like that. 
Our expectations for our own future can often look like that, though, can't it? Staying hopeful that everything will just work out. And this room this morning is filled with people at different points along uh, this train line of life. And I am sure, those of us in this room, we have missed shots that looked like they were the only shot. We've had high highs and low lows. We've succeeded at meeting expectations of ourselves and others. But other times we completely miss the mark of those expectations. No matter what stage of life you're at this morning, this is a reality. And no matter what stage of life uh, you're at this morning, you're probably looking forward to something still. You're still planning for something. We all have expectations for the future. For some of us, that future expectation extends to our death. Maybe it's a funeral plan or a will. Maybe it's an existential crisis at 2 a.m. when we're staring at the ceiling. Maybe instead we just try to avoid even thinking about death. The future, if you are not a Christian here this morning, is scarier than all those other plans Uh, all those other unknowns that that girl talked about in her post. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is saying that for the Christian, the good news of Jesus looks at all that and gives us a joyful expectation of the future based on true events in the past, which change our present. And so let's look at that. What I'm going to do, uh, this passage is uh, not just what we read. Uh, We read from 35 to 58. Uh, This chapter is 58 verses long, and I'm going to actually spend time uh, bouncing around all of it. And so if you have your Bibles, keep them open uh, to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, But I'm going to look again from verse 52. We're going to start towards the end. Uh, This is what our hope is. This is what our expectation is. Paul writes, In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the old saying that is written will come true. He quotes two Old Testament prophets now. Uh, Firstly, Isaiah, who says, death has been swallowed up in victory. And then Hosea, verse 55, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory! The sting of death, it is, it is a truly scary thing, but it's defeated. It has no impact on the Christian through Jesus. And our mortal bodies are clothed with immortality, and death will be swallowed up in that victory. Isn't that an incredible hope for us this morning? An incredible expectation? Paul spends uh, verses 35 to 50 describing a little bit about what that would look like. I don't have time this morning to unpack everything in there, but one of the really cool main ideas is that in heaven we will have bodies. And those bodies will be different. And the difference is in verses 42 to 44, where it says, our bodies that are perishable will become bodies that are imperishable. That's 42. And in 43, we see that our bodies that were and are now dishonorable become glorious, weak, 
to powerful, natural, to spiritual. There is a change. Paul teaches that our mortal bodies will not be revived, but transformed to live imperishably and eternally. Jesus is the victor over sin and death, and we share that victory with him. That is our joyful future. That we as Christians can expect that's not one to make us scared or stressed, but free and hopeful. We don't get this hope, we don't get this gift because of what we do. Uh, other religions and spiritualities. You have to do the right stuff to get some kind of incomplete assurance about a future after death. But as Christians, we can't earn it. If you're not a Christian here this morning and you're thinking, how do I get this beautiful, amazing hope? Well, we're not doing anything. Really, Paul says that he is, he is uh, the least of the first Christian leaders, if you look at verse 4, verses 9 and 10 of this chapter. He went around killing Christians, killing God's people, but even he was given this future hope. And so can we. Not by doing the right stuff, but through the grace, this gift from God that is with us as it was with Paul. So if we don't earn it through our actions, how can we expect this joyful future? Well, only by knowing that this future is based on events from the past. And Paul sets that up for us at the start of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's have a look from verse 3 with me. It says this, for what I received, for what Paul received, he passed on to the Corinthians of first importance. And it was this, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, also, as to one abnormally born. He's seen a problem in the Corinthian church, because uh, they don't understand the future, their future, because they don't fully understand this past truth. You see, he spends much of the chapter... Uh, arguing against a teaching in Corinth. They're saying that there's no resurrection of the dead, which we see in verse 12. This is because at the time uh, there was a Greek philosophy. Now, Corinth, uh, the original readers were in an ancient Greek society, and this philosophy caused those church members to argue that the soul, which is immortal, returns to God who gave it, but that the body is mortal and at death it descends into the grave. The soul, they believed, is to be raised with God and enjoys eternal life, but the body is destroyed. Paul is talking to a group of people who are holding that philosophy with their new Christian faith. And so to help them uh, be more sure of their future, he reminds them of a past truth. He points out what happened to Jesus upon his death and resurrection. And the fact that Jesus' death and resurrection was also a physical one. He explains that the Corinthians can even go so far as to check that it's true. They could write a letter or come visit and meet the, the 12 or James or more than 500 witnesses. And they would have gone. They would have done so. We know that because we have another letter from the, to the Corinthians. The church continued believing this beautiful, beautiful truth, and these people had an opportunity to go back it up with, uh, with, the, with the sources that have heard and seen Jesus, the resurrected, physical Jesus. 
This is so important because if some people hold to a spiritual resurrection of the soul and deny a bodily resurrection, then the inevitable conclusion must be that Christ's body is still in the tomb. And if Christ's body is still in the tomb, then his work, his redemption is meaningless. Indeed, Jesus did not come to earth, die on a cross, and rise from the dead for himself, but for those whom he redeems. And a gospel without that tenet, the tenet of the resurrection, has no message worth telling. Which Paul says in this chapter. If you look at verse 29, he says this. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, verse 30, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What Paul's saying is, what's the point of this? What's the point of me, 2,000 years later, getting up here and saying all this, if the resurrection isn't real? There isn't one. But Paul is assuring his readers and is assuring us that as we look at this amazing event, we can be sure that it was real. This is real history. And as I said before, the Corinthians, they, they know that they believe this to be true, as we have another letter to them. The church kept going and believing the good news about Jesus. And that gave them, and as it gives us, a joyful expectation of the future based in true events from the past. And for them and for us, it changes everything about our present. If there is no resurrection, then nothing is changed in our present. We should eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. But there is. So instead, we read verse 58, uh, which says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. With this truth, our life doesn't look like teenage girl's outlook at the start. She wasn't thinking about her death, sure, she was just thinking about her exams, but she was stressed and worried about whether her life pursuits had worth. She struggled under the expectation of high grades and pressure from family and teachers and society. She is working to the best of her ability and just hoping that everything works out. This gospel, this truth, frees us from fear and death and from fear of all that she was worrying about and all that we are worrying about. For what can defeat us if death is defeated? We can work, we can, with this hope and this truth, we can work to the best of our ability, and know that we'll end up doing something we enjoy. And that is being raised with power and living for eternity with Jesus. We can know, we can work to the best of our ability and know that we will be with people that make us happy. In eternity with God, who is a true source of joy, and with our brothers and sisters 
uh, together in a place where there will be no more sadness and no more tears. For this old order that we are sitting in will have passed away and we get that forever. That's this hope. And so as we work and live, we can predict this. It's not an unpredictable future like this girl was afraid of. Because we have a future assured, a future won for us by the death of, and resurrection of Jesus, a death and resurrection that we get to share in. That is our present, a fearless life, a life in which we can stand firm and let nothing move us. When Paul says that, though, in verse 58, what he's really talking about is standing firm in our faith. Because not only are we free from those kinds of fears, but in that freedom from fear, we respond to God's grace that He has given us by standing firm and the rest of verse 58, which says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Paul here isn't telling everyone in Corinth to become pastors. That's not what this verse means. Uh, Corinth is an ancient metropolis uh, that was actually really similar uh, to Sydney. It's multicultural and bustling and, and filled with trade and wealth and difference. And the church at the time had masters and slaves, poor and rich. These people when called to do this, don't have to give up their day jobs. But in light of the future they have, because of the past they know to be true, they are to still always give themselves fully to the work of the Lord. And so are we. In our workplaces, in our families, if you are a follower of Jesus here this morning... That's my question for you. How is this truth how actually changing our present? How are we going at giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord? Does our life look, look changed from a life like the girl at the start, who was focused on her grades, her career, her future? She was afraid, but giving herself fully to the pursuit of happiness. What are we giving ourselves fully to the pursuit of? Is it money? Is it the next holiday? The next toy? The next high? The next relationship? The next earthly love? A changed life looks like a pursuit of God first and not a pursuit of those things first. Some of those things are really good. I love a good holiday and money is helpful and important. But that is not the top priority, Paul here is saying. Instead, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, it says here in verse 58. Uh, to close for us this morning, uh, I've got a few examples uh, of people in my life who I really admire, uh, who I have seen striving to do this. And I thought they could be helpful examples for us this morning. Um, did Anthony and Trudy come say hi to everyone here? If not, that's totally fine. No? Cool. Uh, there is a lovely couple that we're partnering with uh, as Soul Revival Church uh, who are going over to Ethiopia soon. Uh, they're currently stopped because there is a war happening in Ethiopia. But they are sacrificing so much to leave the safety and comfort of Kirawi, Grace Point, I don't know where they're living now at the moment, 
the safety and comfort of three kids and two grandchildren. Three kids and two grandchildren. Because they are convicted that people need to hear about Jesus. And people need to experience the truth and love of Jesus. And so that's, they're going to Ethiopia for that. That's a really big deal. That's amazing. That is a great example of devoting themselves fully to the work of the gospel. But another example is a friend of mine who recently graduated uh, from um, uh, his uh, training in the military. Uh, he has, I don't, I don't know fully uh, what, where he's at, but I'm pretty sure he's in the SAS. Like, it's pretty hardcore, whatever he's doing. Um, and the stories he tells uh, are insane. Um, and I say, I make a point to point out that it's probably the SAS, because his response in his graduation was, yeah, this is cool, but I don't really care that I'm graduating and starting this. What I care about is church. And actually, what he's doing is he's giving up opportunities for promotion and stuff like that because he is convicted that he wants to, for as long as he can, as long as he is able, stay based here so he can be committed to church. This is someone whose job is as demanding as jobs get. This is the hardcore of the hardcore. And he's looked at that and gone, that's important and I'm good at it. But I'm putting church first. I'm putting God first. Another example. Uh, A friend of mine, uh, he became a Christian at about 26, um, uh, during COVID, so recently he became a Christian, and uh, he was working in IT, uh, and he had his own, he was running his own business, and he was doing really well, uh, and in COVID, when he became a Christian, he became a Christian uh, as a part of a book club he was doing with a bunch of us, and he was reading uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and that was a big part of him becoming a Christian, and because of that, He has put his IT business aside, or at least not prioritised it, and he's opened a Christian bookshop. He lives in Bega, and so he's in this lovely town running a Christian bookshop because he sees the importance of people reading about God and he sees that that changes lives. This is someone who is devoting himself fully to the work of the gospel. I've got one last example. I think the people in this room are a really good example. Uh, Going through this combination of combining uh, Soul Revival and MCC is a really big deal. It had high potential to be really uncomfortable and uh, as someone who has been an Anglican all his life, uh, I wasn't too, th- I'm not too thrown by it, uh, but I can imagine there, there are people here who have not been an Anglican all their life and all of a sudden uh, that is a label getting thrown around. Yes, it's exciting, but it's different, it's challenging and we're still trying to figure it all out, but the decision was made to do the uncomfortable for the gospel. For the growth and strength of this church. And that is an example of a group of people giving themselves fully to the work of the Lord and putting aside the priority of labels or of history and instead saying, I'm willing to do something uncomfortable for the gospel. Uh, A bunch of the teenagers that are downstairs are suddenly in a different youth group with different youth leaders who come in and try and run things 
in a way that is weird, because we're all weirdos. And it is, like, when you see a teenager at this church, tell them you are praying for them, because this is uncomfortable. And this is hard. But they are still rocking up every week, and that is an example of giving themselves fully to the work of the Lord and putting aside the discomfort and putting aside the, the, the unease and frustration that comes with this difference. And that is a sign of theirs and ours changed present. Because we think more people need to know about this joyful future that we have because of, through this, true past. As we partner with God to help people walk through those doors and to look after all and love all the people already here, our labour is not in vain. Stand firm in our family, stand firm in your workplaces. We do these things, we stand firm here, we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord in each of those places. Uh, my bookshop friend and the Eliards, they have left their places of comfort to do that. But my army friend is staying in his workplace to do that. And so that is up to us as individuals. How can we best serve God where we are? Because in all of those examples, whether they stayed or left, their present has changed as a result of a joyful future assured by a true past. Jesus' death and resurrection that we get to share in. I'm going to praise God for that now and I'm going to pray. Uh, and then the band will get up and sing. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the people here that are giving themselves fully to your uh, gospel. Thank you that we know that our labor in, uh, in our work for you is not in vain. Lord, help people walk through those doors. Help us invite and welcome and evangelize and love. Help us do that in the knowledge that we have a fearless present, that we have a joyful future, and that we have an amazing, true gospel uh, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that that is a gift for us, uh, and may we accept it and do something with it this morning. Amen.